Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for thank you for joining us um, at today's event, Innovations in Elections, Making Voting Accessible for Everyone. Um, I want to welcome you. My name is Daniel Castro. I am a senior analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank here in Washington, D.C. Um, ITIF has had the privilege of been, being the recipient of a three-year grant from the U.S. Election Assistance Commission that has investigated opportunities to improve voting uh, for all citizens, especially people with disabilities. Um, and we've had uh, also the privilege of really working with an outstanding group of researchers, um, advocates, uh, and experts uh, from universities and uh, different organizations across the country over the past three years. Uh, and we produced, I think, some really interesting findings about how elections can be improved. Uh, today's event is to really uh, go over um, some of the high-level findings that we've had, to, to take a look at some of the projects, take a look at some of the technologies that have been developed, um, and to say, uh, ask the question, what comes next? Uh, what should be focused on next? This is such a critical issue. Uh, Congress, I think, made the right decision in, in funding this type of research. Um, but what we've done has, I think, proven that this is necessary, but it's not proven that we're done with this research. Uh, it's proven that more is, more is needed, especially to deploy this um, across the country and, and really uh, make an impact. What we're going to do today uh, in terms of the event, we have two panels. Uh, each panel uh, will have a different set of researchers who have been doing different types of projects. Uh, each one will give about a five-minute overview of the research they did. Uh, they'll talk about why they did it, what they produced. We have some of the technology here in the room. Uh, they'll stick around, so if you want to come up and see it afterwards, uh, you can do so. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit of a, a Q&A discussion about uh, you know, what's next, and we'll open it up to questions uh, for each panel. Uh, before we do that, um, we're very privileged to have uh, Mark Riccobono here today to uh, make some opening remarks. For those of you who don't know Mark, he's the executive director of the Jernigan Institute at the National Federation of the Blind. The Jernigan Institute is the only research and training institute developed and directed by the blind. Uh, here, Mark leads a number of really innovative programs designed to advance opportunities uh, for the blind, including the NFB's uh, Blind Driver Challenge, which is an effort to build an interface for a car that would make it independently drivable. Um, by, by anyone. And prior to coming to NFB, uh, Mark worked as an advocate and public administrator providing services to blind children. Um, what you may not know is in addition to being a partner uh, on our grant, NFB has also been one of the leading voices uh, in helping put together the accessibility requirements that are part of HAVA. Uh, many of the improvements in elections that we see today are a direct result of uh, NFB's leadership. So Mark, really appreciate you being here today. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it very much, uh, the opportunity to be here. And thank you for putting this forum together. I think it's really important that we take the opportunity to talk about <clears throat> where we've been and where we might be going. And so thank you for your leadership and for the invitation to uh, kick off today's event with some, some remarks. The American democracy is driven by a class of people who we qualify as eligible voters. As our democracy has advanced, we have expanded the class of eligible voters in an attempt to eliminate discrimina discrimination based on certain characteristics. However, the class of eligible voters also encounters real discriminatory barriers, social, economic, phys physical, which do not receive enough public attention. The question facing us today is not whether people with disabilities are eligible voters, but rather how to shatter the barriers that prevent people with disabilities from equal access to their rights and responsibilities as eligible voters. The National Federation of the Blind knows that blindness is not the characteristic that defines blind individuals and their future. Every day, we raise expectations of the blind because low expectations create obstacles between blind people and our dreams. We recognize that part of living the life we want is having equal access to the systems of our democracy and that disability should not be a thing that holds us back. I was first eligible to vote in a presidential election in 1996. I was a politically interested and optimistic business student at the University of Wisconsin. Yet, when election day came, 
I found excuses not to go to the polls. During the previous two years, as an eligible voter, I had dealt with poll workers who lacked understanding about the capacity of people with disabilities and often lacked respect for the privacy of my ballot. I still cringe when thinking about the nice older poll worker who helped me in one election by serving as a scribe. She had the ability to read the ballot, but she did not possess hearing that was equal to the task. In a loud voice, she would confirm the vote that I whispered to her to make sure she heard me correctly. It did not feel very democratic, empowering, or patriotic. The 2000 presidential election opened the door for passage of the Health America Vote Act in 2002. HAVA required improvements to the electoral process by establishing minimum standards for uniform and non-discriminatory election technology and for the first time required that citizens with disabilities be able to cast a vote independently and privately. After the first decade of the new HAVA standard, it is clear that continued advocacy and innovation is required as the promise of equal access in voting has not yet been fully realized. The National Federation of the Blind was active in the development of the HAVA legislation specifically to get non-visual access included as a requirement under the law. Since 2003, our organization has operated a non-visual election technology project under a HAVA grant from the United States Department of Health and Human Services Administration on Community Living. The goal of our project is to increase the participation of blind voters in the elections process by providing training and technical assistance to protection and advocacy personnel, state and local elections officials, developers of accessible voting technology, and blind advocates. During 2008 and 2012 presidential elections, we hosted an election day hotline and conducted post-election surveys to monitor progress under HAVA. We found that there are still many places that do not have even one accessible voting machine. Furthermore, many of the places that do have accessible voting machines are staffed by poll workers that do not know how to properly manage or troubleshoot the accessibility features of those machines. Our data shows that the percentage of blind voters who report being able to cast their vote privately and independently with an accessible machine decreased from 86% to 75%. Our findings are consistent with the barriers reported in the National Council on Disabilities October 2013 report detailing the experience of voters with disabilities in the 2012 election cycle. These access barriers are further confounded by attempts to return to paper ballot systems under the poorly supported claim that paper is more secure. Many of the emerging debates about voting systems leave one wondering why some people think a segregated ballot for the disabled is the best we can do in 21st century America. The National Federation of the Blind believes we can and must do better. Under our HAPA project, we have spearheaded dialogue about methods for leveraging technology to expand access and preserve privacy. Recent examples of our efforts include establishing a mobile voting working group consisting of developers and users of online ballot marking systems and exploring how voters who are deafblind might utilize their personal access devices with voting machines in a secure manner 
that would, for the first time, provide these individuals with a truly private and independent voting experience. My home state of Maryland is a great example of why simply being eligible to vote does not uh, yet provide equal access to the voting process. The Maryland legislature extended online ballot delivery to all voters and commissioned the building of an online ballot marking tool to be made available to voters subject to the certification of the State Board of Elections. Online ballot marking tools allow the voters to mark their ballot online and then print out the ballot for mailing. These systems, if designed properly, have the potential to permit even more voters with disabilities to vote privately and independently. We were encouraged by the fact that the Maryland State Board of Elections worked to thoughtfully design the ballot marking tool with accessibility in mind, including testing and refining the tool with feedback from the National Federation of the Blind. The final online ballot marking tool was a model for, abs for accessible absentee voting. However, last month, the Maryland State Board of Election failed to certify the ballot marking tool based on far-fetched security and privacy issues. Those same opponents even attempted to suggest that the ballot marking tool was not accessible to people with disabilities. Thus, Maryland currently discriminates against blind voters who need to vote absentee and who also assert their right to a private, independent vote. I first voted privately and independently in 2004, and I am not willing to go back to a time where I was denied meaningful access to the same private and independent voting experience afforded other citizens. Now is a critical time for us to advance the promise of the Help America Vote Act by creating more innovative solutions and strengthening the enforcement of our civil rights to vote privately and independently. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in today's forum, Innovations in Elections, because it acknowledges that accessibility to voting is not secondary to security, privacy, or any other issue. As, as we discuss advances that have been made and are still required in the future, we should not forget that the true innovation of our democracy will be the realization through the establishment of voting systems that provide equal access to all eligible voters, regardless of other characteristics they possess. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. And um, really, uh, you know, your, your comments just illustrate the importance of, of the work that um, our researchers have been engaged in. What I want to do now is, is turn to our panel. Um, and just as a reminder, today's event is being recorded and webcast. Uh, when we turn to the Q&A portion, we do have a mic in the audience. Uh, if, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll bring the mic to you. Our first panelist is Andrew Baranak. Andrew is an industrial designer and research scientist at Georgia Tech Research Institute. He's worked on a number of product design uh, and engineering projects at GTRI, including helping with the design of gloves that educate people about the effects of arthritis on people's hands, um, serial packaging design, and wearable sensors for the military. Um, and Andrew uh, has one of our most innovative products uh, that came out of this research. And Andrew, let me turn it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so my project started 
Back in 2012, uh, before the general elections, uh, with an open IDEO challenge to design more accessible um, voting experiences. Uh, the idea that we proposed, um, we saw that, that Oregon and, and other places were talking about using iPads, and, and Oregon was a leader in that, uh, actually using iPads in some early elections. And our, our goal was to, to take the, the iPad, um, a device that's, that's fairly well known for its accessible, uh, its built-in accessibility, and, and package even more accessibility into that device, making, making for a, an accessible um, absentee ballot marking tool, um, which is this, actually. Um, and the idea is that we repackaged a, an iPad. It's a older, it's an iPad 2 currently. Uh, and we put tactile volume controls on it, uh, added a, uh, a nice exterior input or for, the, um, for headphones. We added switch access uh, for people with mobility issues. We added uh, simple tactile controls um, for people who may not be comfortable using a touchscreen and then built into the iPad itself is voiceover. And um, from, from initial interviews and, and discussions, uh, so from Atlanta, Georgia Tech, and uh, right down the street, it just happens that uh, we have the Center for the Visually Impaired, uh, who's a, it's a great resource, and the people there are wonderful. And I was able to sit down uh, with them on numerous occasions and chat and really just delve into how wonderful voiceover was um, as an accessibility device and, and we really wanted to leverage that along with these other items and so uh, working with that, working with a uh, company out of Canada um, called Komodo Open Lab, we were able to provide uh, um, tactile accessibility to this for, for people with mobility uh, disabilities uh, and create a at least the encasing and, and, and we our, our, my goal wasn't to develop a voting system or the, at least the ballot marking, but I, I created the, the accessible interface for a ballot marking package. So this could be used with anything from, um, from the, the ballot that, that Tina's gonna talk about later to um, the Anywhere ballot to, to any other ballot that's developed. The idea is that you can interface this with existing technology and have a, a usable, portable, uh, easy to understand voting system that, you know, me as, as an able-bodied young male can use it and, and you know, an, an old woman with arthritis in her hands who doesn't feel comfortable using a touch screen can use it and someone with a quadriplegia can use it and someone who's blind can use it. And the idea is that it's, it's one device for all uh, and, and, you know, really not creating that barrier um, between devices and, and so, you know, if a poll worker learns one device, then they learn them all. Uh, that's the general goal with it. Um, and it's just a, it's a simple tablet, portable, um, tactile control that pulls out and it, it can stand up for easy use. And uh, yeah, the idea was that it's a, it's a simple portable device that can even be taken to voters. Um, if somebody's at a hospital or a, uh, a care facility, this can be brought to them so that they can mark their ballot. Um, and as, as uh, Mark was saying, you know, you could pr print a ballot out and, and use a paper ballot or, or some other system. Um, again, that wasn't my focus, but uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful challenge. So that was Thank you. Work. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from uh, Tina Lee. Tina is a PhD student in industrial design, working at the Center for Assistive Technology and Environmental Access in the College of Architecture at Georgia Tech. Um, her research interest is in human-computer human interaction, uh, and she's done a lot of work on universal design and human-centered design and using those approaches um, in her, her work. And her dissertation is actually focusing on uh, designing inter voting interfaces for uh, people with visual impairments. Um, and Tina has been uh, a great collaborator on this project. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Daniel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so our project um, got started from a graduate class, um, universal design, investigator, uh, investigations, and applications at Georgia Tech. So a group of students started to investigate the problems with the current voting process. So one of the problems um, I also know from personal experience is that poor workers often do not know what, what an accessible voting machine is and how to set it up. So as a result, um, people with disabilities, um, in order to use the accessible voting machines, um, whether they cannot use and or they need you know, just help from family members or friends, and in the end, they had to just speak aloud their, all of their votes um, in the public. So what we thought um, 
just just like the same as the Andrew was talking about, the same as the goal, um, keeping in mind uh, one interface for everyone, um, everyone for people with and with it, without disabilities, um, without separate specialized systems. So keeping in mind in from the design beginning of the design process, um, universal design using the universal design principles, um, we developed two alternative ballet interfaces called Easy Ballet and Quick Ballet. Um, I briefly explain um, what the, those two ballets are. Um, I will uh, also like to show the demo. Um, I brought with tablet um, with two interfaces. So Easy Ballet is designed with linearized, um, so which can be easily matched to audio representations. So basically, um, the Easy Ballet has you know the system guided structure. Um, it's asking you, do you want to vote for president and vice president? And yes, they know. So it's like a, from the beginning of process to the end of the ballot, you can only answer yes or no response. You don't need to navigate. You don't need to search any names. You don't need to know how to use the ballot. So that's, that was the one idea we had. And we had some formative study with 21 participants with various um, types of people with disabilities. And we got some feedback. We iterated all the design um, features and uh, refined some of the design features. What we also found from the um, formative study with Easy Ballet, uh, people um, who are able to see or people who are more capable of using the touch screen interface, they are really like to directly touch the name directly without going through all the names um, at a time. So we developed the, um, the Quick Ballet, which is kind of the just like uh, you know, as, as you're looking the visual interface, it's the same as um, similar to looking the current um, the, um, typical ballet interface. But we embedded the audio feature, uh, which is dragging uh, lifting finger. So you can drag um, while you're dragging your fingers up or down. You can hear the names um, what's on the screen and lift your finger to select a vote. Um, I'd like to actually show the demo if you sure. if you don't mind. Sorry. So it would be easier to just to look at the interface and then see um, how it's going to work. This is the easy ballet. Um, we have all the instructions no and how to use the ballet. The and um, basically, we started out all the instructions, instructions um, can be used for non-audio um, audio borders right as well. So that, so, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so basically this is the easy ballet. Um, oh. Why don't you describe what's on the screen? Here? Yeah, uh, this is, I'm sorry. Keep in mind this is supposed to be a prototype, not a working voting <laughs> system. It so. is experimental <laughs> prototype, yes. Um, Your finger from the top left corner of the tablet halfway down to find a raised letter M. No. So basically, there is an explanation about how the general overview ballot yes. and the asking, um, do you, you want to vote for this the president and vice president? Vice president of the yes. yes. Do you want and to then vote um, all the names Joseph of the president Joseph candidates Trump are showing the at a time, the one in a page, so that um, do you want to vote yes for this no. person? Yes or no? Yes. And then there's a sure prompt message. I wish you want to, it's Joseph like a prevention Howard to, you know, if there's like the accident for it. Um, yes. You selected Joseph Barchi and Joseph Halloran from the Blue Party to be president and vice president. So basically, this is you just like a linear structure. Contest. You go through president the structure the and then um, answer the ballot. We don't have to really think about, vote. you know, how to use. And then, you know, the system is guided. Um, so that was the easy ballet. Um, I'd like to show the quick ballet first one. Um, so as you can see, the, their order names are 
in one page. Um, there are six candidates in one page. Um, so for the sighted users, voters, they basically just touch the name. Two of six, Ken White if you can from, see, for non-sighted users, six, basically they just, the you know, Three move six, their fingers six, up or down. Six, two of six, Ken White from the Blue Party. One of six, John Smith from the Blue Party. Two of six, Ken White from three of six, Bob King from the Blue Party. Selected three of six, Bob So this King is the, the um, different approach of the different ballot structure. So we are developing these two different, uh, we developed the two different, this um, different ballot structure. Currently, um, we're testing with this two ballot structure with people with visually impaired and including blind and low vision and people with sighted and who's gonna benefit use this kind of ballot structure and who's gonna benefit use kind of this linearized ballot structure. So um, right now we are um, analyzing the data. Um, I cannot tell you exact the, um, all the data right now, but um, it seems like uh, there are really great features of each different ballot structure. So we hope that we can integrate the, some of the features so that we can improve one single ballot interfaces for everyone. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tina. Um, Sean, I'd, I'd like you to uh, spend a few minutes talking about your project. Uh, Sean Kane is an assistant professor in the Department of Information Systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, Sean's primary research interests are on accessible user interfaces and mobile human computer interaction. Um, and his work's been exploring how to make mobile devices easier to use, um, especially for people with disabilities and people in distracting environments. Sure, all right, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so my project is actually not about uh, ballots. Uh, just to start uh, get that out there. Um, so the project that uh, I've been working on with ITAF has been in the area of um, looking at all of the other work that surrounds voting and preparing to vote and making good decisions in the area of voting. Uh, and in this case, with a particular population, which is adults with aphasia. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we use the term aphasia to uh, refer to individuals who have um, some impairment with language, so that can include reading and writing, but also speaking and recognizing uh, speech. And uh, this affects about two million uh, Americans. And uh, an important thing to note is that individuals with aphasia typically have normal uh, cognitive abilities. And so we're not necessarily uh, addressing issues with cognitive impairments, but rather normal cognitive function, but uh, moderate to severe challenges uh, related to language and working with language. Um, and if you know anything about the voting process, there are lots and lots of words, um, often very complex words. And uh, I, uh, our group actually began this project uh, just by, uh, we were working with uh, an organization that serves adults with, about 50 adults with aphasia in Baltimore, and we're working on some other projects actually around communication tools, but uh, election time came around and this organization was doing uh, extensive work, a tremendous amount of work to help members prepare to vote uh, and to become involved in political, uh, uh, the political process. And so as, as part of our work with ITF, we first started by understanding uh, what, uh, trying to understand what some of the challenges were and what the therapists and other experts uh, within the center were using to make this process more accessible. And uh, as I alluded to, we found that uh, much of the material that uh, the individuals were interested in and in learning about a voting process uh, was inaccessible. So that includes uh, news articles, popular press articles, uh, but also voters guides, practice ballots. Uh, we, we are located in Maryland and, uh, and so looking at things like ballot initiatives. So in 2012 in Maryland, there were quite a number of ballot initiatives with a very complex sentence structure, very complex language. Right? And so if you want to get involved in these issues and uh, have difficulty understanding writing, there's a whole lot of work that you have to do. And um, in this case, what the center was, was doing manually was really just lots of practice, lots of one-on-one -on -one support, uh, lots of uh, repetition, looking at materials. Um, of course, there are many great resources that take, uh, take issues and news and related to politics and simplify them, but for various reasons, not everyone is necessarily interested in using those resources or they may have their own uh, their own interests. And so in our work, we were really looking at how can we help support individuals in, uh, with aphasia in understanding uh, material, working with material that's out there in the world, um, not just that that was designed to be accessible or designed to be um, easy to get into, but also just uh, documents and information out on the, the wild web. And so 
Uh, as part of this project, we've been looking at uh, developing a few software tools that we can actually use to help support uh, this process of working with this uh, very complex textual information, simplifying it, and then using that to help uh, with the voting process. And so we developed uh, a number of tools uh, looking at how to take voters' guides, uh, other practice ballots, other kinds of documentation on the web, um, and looking at ways to uh, potentially transform them, so by removing, uh, for, so for example, websites, removing extraneous com uh, content, focusing on the text, uh, removing ads and other types of things, uh, adding text to speech to these documents if they don't already provide those features, uh, and then also providing the ability to uh, take notes to, and to review notes and, and to include that as part of the, the process of preparing to vote. So we developed uh, tools to provide uh, accessible annotation to documents that are on the web, so including, again, news articles, voters' guides, uh, other types of content, to present notes in a few different formats, so not just text, but also in speech and images and other types of things that may be more accessible for individuals who, who have difficulty uh, with complex te te text, and then to be able to take all that work and all that practice, which the individual might perform alone uh, with a, a therapist or an uh, aide or family member, uh, and then to review that later and to be able to, to go back to that and, and take advantage of that, of that work uh, by printing out uh, you know, uh, summaries of the notes, uh, tips, uh, instructions, those kinds of things for voting. Um, so we developed a number of tools. Um, those are uh, on the web and are available uh, as open source projects um, if you have, uh, would like to see it. Um, if you uh, look me up, you can find this info or you can um, please come talk to me. Unfortunately, I don't have a cool uh, demo with me today. Um, but we've been looking at uh, using this tool within this uh, center that we've been partnered with for about two years now. I'm hoping that we're gonna, um, we've done some formative evaluation with both members and uh, experts at the center. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to continue to include this in the uh, process and f for uh, the vote, the upcoming vote. Um, and I also think, uh, in general, uh, that there is a lot of potential for these tools and looking at, again, all of the work that goes uh, around the process of voting. Um, so not just for individuals with aphasia, but uh, we really think that there's a lot of potential for these kinds of tools for uh, non-native speakers or other types of folks who might have difficulty with uh, just understanding the complexity of some of the issues that, that we're asked to, to consider when we, when we do vote. Um, and so I hope that we'll be able to continue to evaluate this and to help individuals to be more independent and to take more control and have a better understanding of, of how they can participate in this voting process. Great. Uh, thanks, Sean. And uh, last, we'll be hearing from uh, Stephen Blosser. Stephen's an assistant technology specialist at the Resource Center for Persons with Disabilities at Michigan State University, where he's been involved in the um, initial evaluation, system design, construction, delivery, mounting, training, and maintenance of technology systems uh, for people with disabilities. But Stephen's also worked to uh, integrate assistive technology design projects into the Engineering 100 and the Senior Capstone courses at MSU. Um, and within this grant, uh, Stephen did some really interesting work in, in getting these groups to uh, work on uh, accessible joysticks. So, Stephen. Thank you, Daniel. Um, oh, I get the microphone over here. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I did learn something very important in all of this project, and that's why I'm here today to share some of those things with you. Uh, the most important aspect of our project that we discovered during this process was that you can't design an accessible voting machine without people with disabilities. And I was delighted today to hear Mark and others expressing essentially that. Um, we at Michigan State University have um, a number of people with disabilities on our team and um, we work with them. We have about 1,200 students registered with the RCPD we uh, have employees as well, and the community comes to us. Uh, so we have at our access the assistance, and when we started this project, there was a great interest among people with disabilities because of the experiences that they're having, as, as you heard earlier today. And um, this extends beyond the United States. Um, you may not realize this, but there are many other countries. It's estimated that there's 600 million people with disabilities worldwide. So this is a, a huge, huge problem, uh, being able to access voting and, and uh, any kind of systems, typically, 
worldwide. And I work with um, Asian Aid. It's, uh, you can read all about it at uh, www.asianaid.org. And I'm an ambassador for Asian Aid, and I go to other countries and assist people with disabilities by providing technology for them. And this particular project uh, was of interest to them as well, because they vote in some of these other countries, in India, for example. So um, consulting all these different types of disabilities, the resources they have, the technology they have, is something that is being followed uh, by people with disabilities. And it's delightful to see you here today. Uh, MSU has been doing this since the 1930s. So we've got a kind of head start. Uh, if anyone remembers their history, people with disabilities in that period were kind of shunned and, and hidden away. And now uh, we're actually seeing them vote. And some of the machines that are out there are working. And they do, do function quite well. But the important factor is a company without the assistance of all these people for usability tests, for design guidance, it's not going to happen. It has to involve people with disabilities. I was given the commission. Uh, I met with President George Bush Sr. several years ago as I was reaching out. He was delighted to hear that we're sharing this know-how in development of accessibility for access to computers and other things with other countries. And I go there and I freely share the technology that we develop here at MSU in this country uh, with other countries and with their students with disabilities in their schools. Um, I have the assistance not only of our uh, group of students with disabilities, but I have the assistance of our um, usability resources, usability testing resources at Michigan State University where we uh, sponsored this project. Our vision of an accessible voting machine, and this is the advice of the students that I talk with, when they go to a polling booth, they want to see something they're familiar with. And I'll outline it very briefly. It's just a standard computer terminal with a keyboard, a mouse, maybe a trackball, a joystick is the other item. And we focused on the joystick because there weren't very many available that were really accessible. Joysticks are used by a large number of people with quadriplegia and cerebral palsy and other disabilities. And the joystick is an important tool for them. Many of these young people spend a great deal of their lives trying to master a joystick because that's how they drive their electric wheelchair. Some people drive their car with a joystick. Everyone here has used a joystick. Uh, there's one in your shift lever on your car. There's lots of joysticks in your life. So it's a common tool. But the vision is a screen, a keyboard, uh, a joystick, and a mouse. All these inputs should be there. That's what people are familiar with. And that's what we learned as part of our project. Uh, security was mentioned uh, by Mark when he presented as an issue. And the security is important. The, the interface, as I'm describing it, sounds like a computer in its peripherals but it doesn't need to be, just as long as it simulates such a device so that the user doesn't know any different. Um, we worked with a number of different people with quadri quadriplegia as we developed our joystick. And the final joystick that we developed um, is, is here. It has joystick handle, the handle of the robot on my way to carry Steve, if you can somewhere. step back to the microphone, otherwise it won't oh. pick you up. Sorry about that. Um, this joystick is a prototype. It has force feedback. And this is a, a quality that enables it to be accessible by the blind. So that as you move around the ballot, you can feel tactily when you jump to another selection. So as I move it, it, it clicks and, and pulses and lets my hand know that I've moved. If you're blind and you can't see the selection moving on the screen, you'll be able to feel the, the click or the haptic, as we call it, feedback. And you'll also be able to hear it in an earphone. If you're blind, you're listening to it audibly. Announce the candidate, where you're going, and so forth. We did develop a, um, 
a ballot as well. But when we started the project, some of your ballots weren't available. So we had to develop our own. And our own ballot uh, works very similarly to some of those that are being developed. Uh, we had to start from scratch because some of the ballots had difficulty in using them. Um, inside this joystick, just briefly, uh, is the feedback mechanism. And the feedback mechanism that we used was pneumatic. Hence, I have a tank here and some, some tubing. This is a prototype. If we go into production, or if this is mass produced, we would go into a kind of feedback mechanism that involved um, electromagnetics, so that you would be able to use lightweight motors with uh, low inertia, so you could get that quick pulse letting you know where you're at. And basically, that's the joystick we developed and, uh, and some of the things we learned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to open it up to audience uh, questions in a moment. Uh, but first, I just want to turn to the panel. I have a few questions for you. Um, I'd like to have a little bit of discussion on, on some, of these, um, some of these projects. I mean, one thing that I've, uh, I've seen, most of you have worked with us now for, for quite a while. Um, most of these projects have taken um, at least uh, 12 months, if, if not longer. Uh, my first question to you is if you had additional time, if you had additional funding, if you had another year, two years, what would you do next? Um, what do you think is, is kind of critical? And uh, Andrew, if you want to start. Uh, Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, I guess to start off, thank, thanks for allowing us to spend those 12 plus months uh, working on these. Um, it's, uh, it's been an exciting challenge. But I, um, I, I'm, I'm very happy with where my design is now, but it needs a ton of work. Um, and I, I would love to be able to develop more, fine tune some of the things that I've learned. Um, you know, we've gotten into some people's hands, but I'd like to do more extensive user testing to really find out where the issues are, uh, where problems may lie. And, and I'd love to also really start um, interfacing it with a ballot and maybe looking at the next steps. You know, how, how does this you know, how does this device now enabled with a, a working ballot system uh, allow a user in whatever environment they're in to to you know print or or um, submit a ballot in whatever way, shape, or form? Just really look at the next steps and and the whole kind of life cycle of a device like this, um, from from poll worker to voter to, um, to to that voter placing his uh, his or her ballot, um, I guess, or, or casting their vote. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton that I would like to do with this extra. Um, it's it's a great start, but I mean, no designer's ever happy with their work, I don't think, um, <laughs> when it comes down to it. Unfortunately, we haven't seen a lot of uh, version 2.0s and 3.0s of a lot of uh, the research that gets done. And you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. without sustained funding, it's hard to Absolutely. keep it going. Yeah. Uh, Tina, what about you? Uh, so our, the, um, the ballot interface, we started out with the easy ballot with multiple inputs and outputs. And then we're, uh, we kind of focused on more like a ballet structure itself. Mm -hmm. So linear, because li linearized ballet structure was really like a, we re reconceptualized the old ballet structure, which um, not commonly used in, um, the, um, in the typical polling place. So, um, so at, right now we are comparing um, this typical ballet structure with embedded audio feature, but they're um, still, could be like a limitation of for people who are not really used to use the touch screen interfaces itself. So um, if we have more time, I think we would like to expand more um, what kind of different inputs could be used for uh, this ballet itself, like easy ballet, linearized structure versus with the um, even um, the quick ballet with the different inputs like um, um, you were saying about joysticks and um, different types of inputs because many different types of people um, benefit use different types of inputs. So it would be great to have that kind of um, inputs and outputs so that it could be more like a system, um, system wise of the ballet system, not like just a ballet interface. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think there are a few problems that I think are uh, particularly exciting or thinking about how to build off the work that, that we've been able to accomplish so far. 
Um, so one is really uh, working more to close the loop about going from uh, preparation, learning about issues, uh, really studying them, making choices about them, and then, and then going on to the vote. So as I said, uh, our work is mostly focused on this uh, issue of preparation uh, for voting, and I'd really like to see how that carries over to uh, actually performing voting, and particularly with different types of ballots, potentially. Uh, a second area is, as I said previously, really thinking about broadening this approach. So um, I, I think that there are lots of cases where the materials available to help inform voters and to help voters prepare are difficult to work with. And so we worked uh, with a specific population, but I think that many of these issues would, uh, would apply more broadly in looking at other populations, so in non-native speakers, potentially older adults, folks with other types of uh, cognitive and uh, reading-associated disabilities. And I think um, there are some great opportunities there for translational research looking at different uh, populations. Um, and the last, and maybe this is the, the, the 3.0 uh, round, is really thinking about uh, how do we take complex material and present it more simply, but, but thinking very carefully about how to preserve the intent and the accuracy uh, of the information. And so uh, looking at the population that we've worked with so far, um, you know, their current practice is really highly mediated by other individuals. So whether that's teachers, whether that's uh, aides, uh, potentially poll workers, family members, um, as Mark shared in his story earlier, when you're involving other individuals in the process of voting, there are a lot of concerns that come up, in particular when we take some material and summarize it, how do we make sure that that is a, a summary that, is, that reflects what the individual is actually looking for? And I, th I think there are some opportunities there in terms of design and technology to think about how do we, how do we simplify while preserving, uh, preserving the attributes that are most important to the individuals who, are, who need this simplified or this alternative version of the material? Uh, this is the question I was hoping would, would, I would get. Uh, this is the National Press Club. And uh, this project at Michigan State University became a very popular item. It was covered in the, the, the newspapers, in the radio, and even our local television stations. And it received a lot of phone calls we did uh, about accessible voting, because there's a lot of people out there that want to participate in this. And what I'd like to see happen is for us to take some of these tools that we've developed and do uh, national usability tests. We have a, a network of resource centers of different types across our country. And I'd like to take some of these tools that some of the other team members here have developed and package them and put them into a form that people can volunteer, people with disabilities can come in and try out uh, these devices and, and use that as a guide to help us develop and refine the voting systems. And uh, Michigan State University is prepared to take on this and we have local people there, but uh, as I said, we can open this up to a national group across our country, even internationally. I have people in India who are interested in this. So we could do some testing around the world of accessible voting and, and computer access systems. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a question, um, please just raise your hand and, and Will will um, bring in the microphone to you. Um, and, and don't be shy. Uh, if not, I have plenty more questions for our panelists and uh, then we'll be switching out to our second panel. But we have a question right here on the third row. Hi, thank you very much. My name's Lynn Garland. Um, this question is for Andrew. Um, thank you for your presentation. It seems like what you're designing is, could be really, really useful. Um, and you mentioned that there's a possibility of printing out a ballot from your device, and I want to know a little bit more about that and how a blind voter would verify um, the ballot, if you could do. And a couple of other issues, if you don't mind. I, I believe Oregon uses some kind of device like this, and it's been very successful, and I want to know how yours differs um, and from Oregon's or any other states that might use something similar um, where people, I guess the election officials go bring such a tablet to, to people who would find it useful. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Lynn. So for your first question, I, I, I guess I didn't make it completely clear. The idea would be to, this device itself wouldn't print anything. It would, uh, I mean, there, there are many ways now to interface iPads with a, um, with a wireless printer. Um, I, I've, 
heard this discussed a numerous ta numerous times of, of how one would would do um, accessible absentee voting. Uh, Mark talked about it that there was the the online ballot marking and a, a ballot could be printed out and then verified on a paper ballot. Um, to be honest, I haven't done that much work on the issue on the the. Uh, um, I guess on the on the whole life cycle after the the vote is done, um, so I don't have a printer I picked out any of that. Um, it's I, I know it's been talked about. Uh, there are other ex experts and, and other knowledge in that field, um, but that is something that I'd like, to, as I was saying, uh, that I would like to pursue more to really see how that happens and, and how that's done with the ballot. That would have to be something that's done in the software that's verified and then printed out. Um, as for the the Oregon uh, things that you mentioned, I. From my research and, and talking with uh, with people out there, they were using a standard iPad, uh, and they had a ballot interface on it, and they were um, they were inputting their votes on the ballot. I forget how the um, how the ballots were were verified or cast, um, but I know they were just using a standard iPad. The idea with this kind of grew out of that idea, where it was accepted, um, but taking more than just a regular iPad and just really adding those other accessibility features onto it, making it an all-in-one accessible, durable package that, that's easy to use and that's a kind of secure package. Yeah. I just want to add on uh, to Andrew's remarks. Uh, prior to this uh, research grant, uh, we were looking at accessibility for recently injured veterans, and uh, one of the big findings there was the need to be able to uh, bring in into uh, a VA um, hospital, into a long-term care facility, uh, an accessible device. And so, you know, you have an iPad, but that's not necessarily accessible in a hospital setting. And Andrew's work has really, uh, you know, proven the concept that it's possible to take, uh, you know, a commercial off-the-shelf uh, hardware and transform it into something that's truly accessible uh, in an election environment. Uh, Jim, you had a question here. Uh, Jim Dixon, the National Council on Independent Living. Um, just two points of information. One, the Oregon election officials have been really rigorous in um, attempting to make absentee voting accessible. But sad to say, it's very, very hard to, and so far has not worked because the usage is very low. The difficulties of letting people know that such a devices are available have been insurmountable. And just as a point of clarification, speaking back to Mark's point about Maryland's recent decision to discriminate against voters with disabilities. Um, Lynn's organization played a ma major role in, in taking away our right to use that system. Um, so I, I just want to take the uh, moderator's prerogative to ask one last question of the panel. Um, I think it's, uh, if we look outside of elections and we look at the technology, we, we see that there are many things that are not um, accessible by default. Um, and I, when I look at the projects that um, all of you have pursued, you've, you really focus on the idea of universal design. Um, and since you've been, um, we have uh, three uh, very young uh, designers and engineers, as well as someone who's been uh, you know, leading in this field for a long time. When you think about the engineering curriculum, when you think about your own, you know, what you're teaching students and what you've seen in your own curriculum, how do we make you know, universal design, um, you know, accessibility by default, um, something that's taught at, at kind of all levels and, and really built into the curriculum? And Stephen, why don't we start with you and we'll work down okay, this way. We'll work back. Well, I have a friend, uh, let's see if I get this mic over here. I have a friend named Greg Vanderheiden, who um, I'm sure would be delighted to be here. Uh, we've been working together uh, on projects since the 70s. And um, universal design is something that is just the way that everything is done. I help teach universal design at Michigan State University's uh, engineering department. and. These are the principles that we should follow. Uh, the ballots that we're creating, uh, they need to comply 
as we have guidelines already. There's a YCAG 2.0 for uh, web accessibility guidelines. These are th these are the ways that it should be done. It's very simple to, to do if you follow these. It does take a lot of effort, of course. You have to be a programmer. But sharing these methods with our young people, and I'm delighted to see them, them here, and they're learning these techniques. Um, these will enable us to make an accessible ballot. It's a doable project. It's not that big of a challenge technically, but we're not doing it. And it's not happening because a lot of engineers are graduating from our universities. They're going out and they're working in companies, and then when they're asked, how do I make this accessible, they go in their office and sit in the corner and try to do it. They don't have the help, as I mentioned earlier, of this large body of people with disabilities to come in and guide them and show them how they use these tools. So that's the key element. That's what I started by saying. And that's what I'll end by saying. You need to include people with disabilities in this development work. It needs to include them. Thank you. Right. So first I'll, I'll agree with Stephen and say I think uh, involving individuals with disabilities at, at all levels is, is really uh, crucial. Uh, I think th there is a real gap uh, in the engineering uh, space of uh, students, people with disabilities are severely underrepresented in STEM fields and that problem gets worse as you move higher up in the hierarchy. So uh, we have a lot of work to do there. Um, I think, you know, for, in general for students, uh, you know, finding ways for them to actually engage with real people who have disabilities and the problems that they have and the work that they do to, to overcome the aspects of the world that are inaccessible is, is uh, quite important. So uh, in my lab, we uh, for graduate students, um, it's now becoming pretty standard that you have to go and have an internship with some organization serving with people with disabilities or volunteer regularly. You really spend time out in the field. Um, with large classes, there are other ways to do that, so field trips, bringing uh, folks in, and so forth. Um, and then I think the, the third thing I'll, and final thing I'll say is just that, uh, especially in the context of engineering and design, is to convince people, I believe that it's true, but to demonstrate that accessible design is also innovative design and a challenging design. So accessible projects are cool to work on because there, there are so many interesting problems to solve. Uh, and so to really push innovation and creativity as a part of, uh, of design and engineering and, and to create accessible objects, we can also solve exciting and difficult problems. So the, the class I took, um, the universal design um, at, um, in my master class, so what I learned is, um, you know, the making, um, developing accessible design, it's not just for people with disabilities. It's not um, just for like, um, you know, there not really categorization between people with disabilities, people with, without disabilities. There are just people uh, with different limitations different level of limitations. So um, many researchers now saying, um, if we make it, you know, the product um, designed well for people with disabilities, that can also work for people without disabilities. I really believe that kind of the aspect of design and a lot of it, um, design process, a product development um, process, um, you just finish the product for non-disabled users and then um, they add it on as on features, add on the accessible features, so that um, it may not work really, it may not really integrate the features together. So uh, it's really important in design and engineering schools. Um, students need to know um, there are various types of you know users. So really fully need to understand um, what are their barriers and barriers with uh, using the product, um, different types of the um, technology, so that. Um, you know, having the empathy from the beginning of design process um, to the end of process, design process, how we make it work for this, and then it can also use for everyone. So I think that's um, keeping the empathy and then um, being with the um, people with disabilities that could be really great um, in education as well. Because um, myself also, um, when I was taking the class and when I started with this project, um, one of my fr friends, he is blind, so I went to board with him. So I learned a lot of things um, 
what's the current barriers and what he could not use, why he could not use the current machines and what are the mach what are the problems. So that's also important to being around with the people with um, various types of users. You guys have really covered a lot of it. Um, thanks. Uh, did, did some of the work for me, but I, I guess to echo what Tina says, I, I've always been a strong believer that you know if you um, you know, d design for those who aren't currently designed for, you just make stuff better for everyone else. The annoyances that, 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 you know, someone may have on a regular day become huge issues for someone with a disability. Um, but there's still annoyances for, you know, f for 95% for of the population. And if you can get rid of the big barriers for, for the people with disabilities, then those go away too. And that's just good design. And it's like you said, it's a, it's a great challenge and it's a great, I mean, as a designer or an engineer, like our job and our, our passion is solving these cool challenges and giving ourselves, um, you know, you know, the next challenge to, to, to overcome. And so it's just, some of it's just a fun exercise in some ways, uh, but it's also just, we always have to keep in mind, and I see it getting better and better as, you know, as I've gone through my career and as I've gone, you know, past my education and everything, that, and I think, I think people are starting to understand this more, but we interact with all of these products on a daily basis and humans are the, you know, the interface between the technology always. And a lot of times that's forgotten in engineering, I feel like, but it's getting better. Uh, as long as that can be stressed that, you know, humans are always gonna use these things and no matter what, you know, then, you know, get those challenges and fix them up and we got a good system. Great. Well, please join me in thanking our first panel. We're going to move right into the second panel. Um, so if you want to uh, step this way, and we'll bring the other panel in that way. But please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you. Great, so um, we'll just go ahead and jump straight into our second panel. Um, you'll see that our, uh, for the most part, our, our second panel has a slightly different focus. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Catherine uh, Summers, actually, uh, because Catherine um, and, and her team worked on a really interesting project uh, on creating a new ballot, and I think that relates most to what we were originally talking about, so I wanna start with you. But Catherine Summers is an associate professor at the University of Baltimore. Her work focuses on making medical and other information easier to find, navigate, and read on the internet for people with low literacy skills. She has also done observational research using eye tracking measurements to investigate how to make online forms easier to use for people with low literacy. And she brought a lot of these uh, skills and methods into the work she did on our project. So Catherine, why don't we start with you? Okay. So I did bring a fancy demo, um, but I brought it in your pocket. So. If you, how, I just want to ask, how many of you have seen the Anywhere ballot? Okay, if you have not seen the Anywhere ballot, I would like you to look at the Anywhere ballot on your web-enabled mobile device. It is at anywhereballot.com, and it is available under a Creative Commons license. Um, it is a finished it's a prototype, but it's it's a prototype that's ready to launch and is going to be, it's currently being used or it's being worked on so that it can be used in which county in, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, the Los Angeles Voting System Assessment Project. Um, the Los Angeles Voting System Assessment Project um, recently announced that it would be the foundation of their ballot design. Um, there's obviously more to it. They're, they're actually going to base their back end systems on the basic design principles that you guys worked out. Right. Um, we also used the Anywhere Ballot principles in many, in much of the redesign for the Maryland online ballot marking system that I worked with um, over this last year, which uh, Mark Riccobono talked about. So the, 
the purpose of the Anywhere ballot was in fact focused on um, universal design. This goal that 90% of the population could use the same interface without additional adaptation. The fundamental principle was that you could mark your ballot using your own assistive technology in whatever location you preferred. Um, we designed the, the Anywhere ballot using participants who were older, who were less experienced with tablet devices, who had lower literacy skills, or who had mild cognitive impairment. Uh, because for universal usability, if you can make it easier to use for those who might be at risk, it ends up being easier to use for everyone. Um, we found many small tweaks that you might not even notice if you look at the ballot. What, if, you looked, if you took a minute to look at the ballot, what you saw is that it's beautiful. That's Drew Davies. <laughs> it's very, very beautiful. It's very clean. It's very inviting. But behind that clean, inviting, beautiful exterior is some very careful design founded on the principles of plain language and plain interaction. And the brilliant term, plain interaction, we actually uh, got from Sean Kane, who was just up here. We were on, a f on the phone with him, and we were describing to him all of the interaction design principles that we, had, that, that we had embodied in the ballot. And he said, oh, so plain interaction. And we're like, yes, that's the term we've been looking for for a decade, <laughs> about how to sum up you know, helping people focus on what they need to do and removing other in distractions and interactions so that they can, so that all their cognitive, physical, and attentional resources can be focused on actually voting. Uh, we were very successful. The Anywhere ballot is a thing of beauty. It works very well. Um, and as I said, it became the, the foundation then, in many ways, for the Maryland online mark ballot marking tool. And I'm going to end with a just a, a little narrative. Um, Mary Beth was 13 years old when she had an allergic reaction to a, a medication, and it destroyed her optic nerve in about a week. And uh, she had to drop out of her uh, sports teams and begin her life as, as almost completely blind. She's now grown and has two fully sighted children, one three, one seven months. She participated in a couple of rounds of voting research at the University of Baltimore this year, um, one with a paper ballot marking system that would be deployed in, vote, in polling places, the other with the online ballot marking tool. For the paper ballot marking system, she had to take her two-sided toddlers, one tied on a, on a tether, <laughs> the other in, um, on a, in a stroller, negotiate her way to a bus, then the um, metro system, then find her way to the, from the, the, the metro stop to the University of Baltimore, find her way through the building while trying to corral two sighted youngsters. It took her an hour and a half. Um, it's, my, it's telling me I'm out of time, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when she got there, her children were furious and, and, and crazy. <laughs> And um, to use the paper ballot marking system, she had to use both hands um, and the headphones. And so if she, we had not had spare graduate assistance to hold her seven-month-old and distract her three-year-old, she probably would not have been able to vote. Um, in contrast, with the, paper, with the online ballot marking tool, um, Oh, and then she had to go home <laughs> afterwards with, with, with these kids and multiple. Yeah. So when she f to did it from home, she was able to turn on a movie for the three-year-old in the living room, time the session for when her seven-month-old was asleep. All she had to do then was walk over to her computer, her familiar computer that she, that she knew how to use so there was no learning curve, no, no lack of familiarity, mark her ballot, and then press print with a print setup that she already knew how to do um, and how to use. Mm -hmm. Stuff the envelope, stuff the, the result. It, she was told where to sign, um, you know, 
on the third page that comes out of the printer, three inches down, one inch over, signature line, stuff it in an envelope and mail it off. And she was able to vote with no um, difficulty. That is the goal of the Anywhere ballot that you can mark your ballot with your own technology where in your, in your own um, familiar environment. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Whitney, I'd like to um, ask you to, to talk a little bit about um, the Open IDEO project and, and the uh, workshops that we did. Uh, Whitney's been the project coordinator on the um, Accessible Voting Technology Initiative grant. Uh, she has a rich experience working on usability and accessibility in elections. She served on two federal advisory committees. Uh, she's helped write the um, Voluntary Voting System Guidelines, or VVSG, uh, with the Election Assistance Commission. She's also worked on the Section 508 Accessibility Requirements uh, Refresh with the U.S. Access Board. And she's been a, just a really tremendous um, asset on this project. So thank you. Thanks. Lydia. Thanks. It's been really great to see these projects live and, and finished. We've kind of nurtured them over three years. and. When we started this project, um, one of the things we boldly wrote in our proposal was that we were going to look for new ways to do innovation because uh, isn't the definition of insanity that someone wrote doing the same thing over and over again without trying something new? And one of the ideas we had was that um, we wanted to engage people who weren't already engaged in elections but we also wanted to engage them with people who were engaged in elections so that we were bringing together domain knowledge, new ideas, and deep skills, and um, the experience of creating very various forms of technology. So we had two projects um, that happened in our first year. Um, I was really pleased Andrew's project came out of one of them, Tina's project also. Um, the first was a project that we did with Open IDEO. IDEO is a um, large and design company in this country. They've um, promoted an idea called design thinking, which some of us call user-centered design. But the idea here is that you don't send an expert off in the corner and think deeply and, and out pops a brilliant idea, that design is a process of engaging with the environment where that product will be used, with the people who will use that product, with the people who will maintain it, manufacture it, and so on. Um, they're very interested in the process of, of how innovation happens, and they've created this platform um, both so that people like us could use it, but also um, as a way of learning about innovation. It's a, a community of 30,000 or so people around the world, um, and they've developed a process that starts with getting people to collect inspirations by giving them things to do, like go find someone you know who might have a disability and, and talk to them, or go think about things in your community uh, and come up with a set of inspirations. Um, the second phase of this is to take those inspirations and think about what they inspire you to do, to come up with concepts. Those are discussed, engaged, and, de and debated by the community. They get refined. And in the end, we picked 12 that we thought were particularly good. The thing that I thought was amazing about it was watching, for instance, a young woman from Turkey um, come up with a pretty darn good idea about how we might run polling places better. Um, at the end of it, Daniel and I sat down and we wondered whether what we had was really innovative and what does that mean? Uh, does it mean something completely brand new? I actually think it doesn't. I think it means taking the things we have already and doing something fantastic with them. Uh, one of the ideas the group got engaged with was the idea of pop-up voting centers. You know, could you like like pop-up stores over the holiday? Could you have voting booths, that, voting polling places that could pop up in the community in places where people went already? And I was fascinated in the election after this um, the challenge that in Iowa. Uh, where they have early voting, there's a program where anybody in the community can get 100 signatures and ask the polling officials, the election officials, to come set up a polling place at their community center, at their block party, at their church, at their store, and they come out for two hours with, well, things like portable voting systems, maybe in a case designed like Andrew, where it's all sort of built into something that's easy for a poll worker to manage. And I thought this was really great because it suggests that um, even without any previous knowledge of elections, they were thinking about and pro solving problems that people within elections are also thinking about and experimenting with ways to solve it. The second thing we did were uh, voting workshops. Um, John Sanford and Karen Milchis and um, Claudia Rabola from the Center for Assistive Technology and Architecture, CATIA, um, organized these workshops for us. They're based on design thinking principles. What we brought, did was bring together, uh, we did two of these workshops. Each of them we brought in 32 people. We had election officials. 
We had people who worked on voting systems. We had people with disabilities. We had designers. We had designers with disabilities. Um, we had people who we thought might bring something interesting to uh, technology ideas or architectural ideas. And we put them through a day and a half's process of starting with thinking about what the barriers are, um, doing lots of drawing and writing and brainstorming of solutions. There was a process where the whole group walked around and kind of voted on what they thought the most interesting were. They were carried on. One of the things that we learned from this is it's a little hard to take someone who's not a designer and throw them into a design environment. And so our solution for this was we used um, students. Um, we had industrial design students who worked with each of the four groups uh, that were working, and they were their hands. Um, so these are people who draw for a living, right, who, who are going to be designers. And they created, they worked with the group. So someone could be talking, and the designer was, was sketching at the same time. And that could be described back to the group and refined and iterated so that you didn't have someone excluded from the creative process because they couldn't see to draw, because they weren't comfortable drawing, because they weren't confident in their drawing skill, or in their ability to articulate a design, a design idea. So having someone to help midwife that process was really important. We came out of the, each of them with um, four to six um, different concepts that were sort of elaborated out, um, looked at against its strengths and weaknesses and against universal design principles. And again, I'm really pleased that several of those ideas have been carried forward, some directly. I mean, uh, a couple of people, of officials have said, this idea, we heard about it from here and it was really a nice idea. We're looking at how we could carry that forward. Some are ideas that we see glimpses of and it's hard to trace the exact root of transmission, but either we picked it up from them or they picked it up from us or we're working together on it. Um, but the most exciting thing that I'm seeing is uh, back at, at Los Angeles where Dean Logan and his staff, um, led by Efrain Escobedo and Monica Flores and many other people from his staff now, have started doing similar sorts of design workshops. So when they bring their advisory committees together, instead of everybody sitting around a big table and talking for a day, they're doing work, they're exploring things, they're thinking through processes and actually doing bits of design work that solve some of the problems that the staff on the project is working on um, in a creative way. Um, when we finished the workshops, we of course had feedback forms because you would, and we asked people to identify their role. And there were two quotes that really struck me. One was from an election official who said, it's not that I don't work with people in my community, it's that usually we're having a advocacy moment together. We're not working together. And to have a day and a half when we could put all of that aside and simply work together. Um, I could hear things, I could say things, I could listen to problems, I could bounce ideas off of them and I didn't have to worry about there being stupid ideas. And from someone who was um, an advocate for a disabilities rights group, they said, we spend a lot of time in our own bubble, in our own little echo chamber, talking to each other. And it was fabulous to be able to be in a room with people with lots of different viewpoints, being able to throw problems out that we see and hear lots of different solutions. So when you get the two sides of an advocacy equation um, with the same reaction to a process, it kind of struck me that this was a good sign. And I was really pleased that we were able to, to do that. Thanks, Whitney. And um, you know, really, uh, it, when we talk about outcomes from, from a research grant like this, I mean, typically we're talking about technology products. Um, but in this case, you know, the processes that we uh, really pioneered and tested and, and I think very, very much succeeded in, in using um, show how inclusive design can be used in, in many different areas. Um, and it, one of the reports that we have outside is um, 50 innovations in elections. Um, and so that report captures many of the ideas that came about uh, in the Open IDEO, uh, Open Innovation Challenge, as well as in the workshops. Um, so next, I'd like to ask uh, Fran, uh, uh, Fran Harris, uh, right here to my left. Uh, Fran is a research scientist at the Center for Assistive Technology and Environmental Access uh, at Georgia Tech. I wish mm -hmm. you guys had a, an easier name. <laughs> That's the last time I'm going to say that today. And a visiting lecturer at the um, School of Education at the University of Dublin. Over the years, her work has employed a wide range of both quantitative and qualitative uh, methodologies to better understand and evaluate the role of assistive technologies in defining and constructing disability, the relationship between pain and health, and in uh, assessing the efficacy and impact of assistive technology devices on social and civic participation. And she also brought um, these unique skills to um, some, I think, very innovative work uh, that we did on our project. So, Fran, I'd like to invite you to talk about that. Thanks, Daniel. 
Um, one of the things that we were charged to do um, in this project, which was just so much fun, um, was to interview voters with disabilities um, about what helped and hindered the process and also what made it and how it was made meaningful to them. Um, and we interviewed voters with a wide variety of disabilities across, across the country. And uh, these were ethnographic interviews, which basically means they were in-depth and semi-structured. We had a, a series of questions we wanted to ask, but we let voters amplify them or define them in the ways that they wanted. And many of the answers were, and were, had been restated before. Um, the inaccessibility of polling places, problems with parking, the problems in using voting technologies. But one of the most significant, it was the significant factor that came out as both a facilitator and a barrier were the central role of poll workers. Um, poll workers are really the gatekeepers to the voting experience. Um, how they assist or don't people who come into the polling place was a central topic. Um, they talked about as a help, they mentioned poll workers as being um, attentive, friendly, courteous, knowledgeable about the voting technologies is very important to them, uh, being able to assist and troubleshoot. Um, they talked about the polling places and how uh, poll workers could make them accessible physically or not by removing obstacles um, in hallways, for example, or providing adequate signage. Um, and in contrast, the things that were really unhelpful were, were um, inadequate knowledge um, of poll workers about uh, voting technology, they didn't know how to assist or even recognize many people with disabilities. And we found that the outcome and the themes of this research, um, it prevented them from having a sense of inclusion in the voting process. Um, their ability to vote privately and independently uh, was uh, compromised. And there was also a sense of stigma um, that voters experienced, either by being made to feel conspicuous or um, to stand out and feel different um, from other voters. So this gave us the idea for the next project, which was to develop an online um, poll worker training course. And to this end, what we did was we interviewed poll workers from around the country, poll worker trainers, and other election officials um, to try and get their perspective on what they were doing. And um, one of the things initially that we found was that there is such a variety of um, poll worker training programs, um, different states, different precincts, um, stress um, training for people with voters with disabilities, um, in, you know, some in very perfunctory ways and other, and other ways much more involved. And we also found that um, uh, poll workers are assigned a variety of different roles. Some poll workers are given one task um, at a precinct or a polling place, and others are expected to perform multiple tasks, registration, learning how to use the machines, and, and, and assisting people. And the third thing that really came out was that the issues that um, poll workers um, were are facing with voters with disabilities really applied to a wide variety of people, people not just um, who self-identify as having a disability, but perhaps elderly people who might have multiple disabilities and who don't actually perceive themselves as being disabled. Um, people, um, a pregnant woman who is feeling harassed by, um, you know, ha I'm having two children, somebody with a temporary injury. And in some ways, this speaks to universal design principles that really an inclusive um, training for poll workers allows them to anticipate and address all these problems. So uh, one of the things we did was create a program that addressed multiple issues um, that poll workers have control over. Um, one was voting rights to educate people about voters um, who are registered, that they do have a right to vote and that they are not in a position to judge their competency to vote because they may act or speak in a way that's different. Um, we also developed five scenarios based on um, a complex or multiple disability types. For example, an elderly man who may have uh, mobility, vision, and hearing impairments. How do you address them? Um, beyond etiquette, which most poll worker training courses um, do, 
um, there's very little experience in actually how to assist. And I guess the key, the key theme that emerged was you need to ask um, if a person wants to be assisted and if they do, how they want to be assisted. And how do you recognize um, a disability? One of the big challenges was, for example, people who have hidden disabilities, somebody who is hard of hearing, it may not be apparent, or they may be speaking a different um, language. Um, maybe English is not their first language and they're having trouble communicating. Or um, cognitive disabilities, which span a huge range. Um, it can be everything from autism, dyslexia, a traumatic um, brain injury. And one of the examples we used was um, a veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder, which also included a traumatic brain injury. Um, how you might recognize somebody who might behave a little differently, who might startle with no, uh, uh, at loud noises or light, and how do you approach them? Um, when somebody asks you for help, for example, you might have to repeat um, uh, directions more slowly and, um, and a number of times, and you need to ask and to be patient. Um, with people who might have a cognitive disability. And so the course is actually organized, um, organized as a series of tips with these five scenarios kind of binding them together. Um, and I think what it does is it tries to or, um, offer practical problem solving um, scenarios that will help assist poll workers to both recognize and treat voters with disabilities and allow them to vote privately and independently and with dignity. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the course was um, actually launched um, for comment um, earlier this year in, in 2014. And we have received um, a lot of comments from election officials around the country and we're hoping to be able to um, incorporate those and then launch the program um, and offer it to different states and precincts from around the country. And we'd, I'd be happy to give the URL if you'd like to take a look at it. We would love people's feedback. And it's also uh, listed in the booklet that we have mm -hmm. uh, okay. out there. Um, so, and, and last we have uh, Sharon Laskowski. Sharon is a computer scientist at NIST, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Since 2002, Sharon's been leading the effort at NIST to develop the accessibility and usability standards and test methods for voting systems in the United States, and she works closely with the U U.S. Election Assistance Commission. She's worked closely uh, with us in our grant, um, including uh, reviewing many of the grants and, and proposals that have now come to fruition here. Um, in addition, uh, NIST, of course, has been doing uh, its own work on um, voting accessibility and, and usability. I've invited Sharon to share some of her reflections on, on the progress we've seen over the past three years. Okay, thank you. And first, I want to thank the Election Assistance Commission for funding the Successful Voting Technology Initiative. And a special thanks to Pat Leahy, who's sitting in the front row here, for all his hard work in coordinating all these efforts. And thanks to Daniel and Whitney um, and all the researchers that were part of the ITIF team, um, because there's some fan fabulous work in accessibility for voting that has come out of this. Now, in, in general, for those of you that don't know who, who NIST is, in general, uh, we focus uh, in, in many areas on research uh, focused on standards, measurement, and testing. And as Daniel mentioned, we've uh, worked with the EAC and collaborated with election officials, manufacturers, uh, voting test labs, and researchers under the Help America Vote Act um, to develop voting standards and test methods um, uh, and in particular, my group focusing on accessibility and usability um, for, all, for all voters, more of a system focus um, up until now. And uh, as many of you know, uh, we helped develop the uh, vo voluntary voting system guidelines. Um, and that has, being involved from the beginning has given me a perspective on how dramatically hardware and software have changed since the Help America Vote Act, and yet we're still at VVSG 1.0, which was done on a very tight timeline in um, an era before smartphones, uh, very kiosk-based. And, I, and um, so what we're currently looking at, in, in addition to try to shore up the kind of testing with better test methods and test assertions for the existing standards, is to think about this 
emerging next generation voting systems and what are they going to look like. Um, and along with that, and I think you've heard some of it today, is also looking at how this technology um, and emerging uh, new ideas and emerging technology has also opened up changes in processes. I think Catherine um, in her narrative gave an example of how one could um, uh, prepare your ballot, make your choices at home, and either mail it in or bring those choices to the polling place to then cast your vote without having to spend time, especially depending on your circumstances, um, having difficulty with technology that you're not familiar with or that is not fully accessible to you. Um, so the, the, the research we're doing at NIST is to really understand, I've been doing a lot of listening and a lot of reading and a, a lot of going to meetings to really understand a lot of the ideas from, from all the researchers in accessible voting um, and think about what we can do to put this into the next generation of standards and what does that mean. So, so the challenge is to, to look at this wonderful research and also, as was noted in the, 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 the prior panel, the fact that we do know how to design for good accessibility, for universal design, for inclus inclusiveness, for, uh, uh, and design as, uh, for systems to work well with assistive technology. So how do we get ahead of the curve to put that into guidance so that these ideas actually get into the next generation of standards. Um, and so when I, I, I look at the, the landscape, just on what has come out of the ITIF research team is in innovations on, on workshops to change the voting process, research on fonts, layout, plain languages, issues with aphasia, research on mobile devices um, like, like iPads and and uh, to uh, how you allow accessible voting at places other than the polling place. Uh, ballot designs, the Anywhere ballot, the Easy ballot, a lot of guidance on best practices uh, for accessibility, like at the University of Washington. Assistive technology, we heard, um, uh, we saw the joystick uh, today, for, for example. Um, um, so what, we've, what we're doing at NIST is putting together what we call a next generation voting platform test bed so we can ins install implementations and designs there and play with them and really explore some of the fundamental issues um, in these designs and the fundamental principles and what can be put into guidelines, best practices in terms of design um, and I, th I think there, there is a lot there. And, what do, and, and when and how do you test with your users and in what context? How do we encourage user-centered design um, and, and testing with, uh, with and for individuals with disabilities for universal design um, at the man manufacturer's level and also in terms of then testing to, to meet standards and certification, whatever that will mean in this next generation of, of systems. Um, and so we hope to, to and I, I, just uh, a few ideas, so, so we hope to have uh, lots of examples of what works. Uh, one way to get ahead of the curve is to show, uh, to, to show good examples of implement implementations along with guidelines, best practice standards uh, to show that this, this, this can be done and that it's not difficult in terms of putting these into, into designs um, and really getting a lot more evaluation with the users in the whole process uh, from the design of these systems to deployment and certification. Um, so again, I want to um, uh, thank uh, the researchers who have done a, a fabulous job and, and I really want to do, uh, we want to do our part at NIST to get this deployed effectively. Great. Uh, thank you, Sharon. And, and picking up on that point, um, just opening up to the rest of the panel, you know, translating research into practice is, is, I think, one of the most important points, especially coming off of a grant like this where we see so many great ideas that, you know, have been tested that people want to take to the next step. Um, 
I just want to open this up. I mean, what are the challenges in doing this? It seems like some fields we do this much better than others. It seems like in elections we've really struggled to take some of the ideas that have, you know, come out of labs that, I mean, I, I'm not going to uh, point to anything specifically, but there are uh, projects that have been going on for, um, you know, three, four, five years that people say are ready for, you know, ready for actual elections that aren't in elections yet. What will it take to, you know, get new technology, get innovations in the hands of voters and the hands of election officials? Whitney, I'll start with you. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll leap into that one. <laughs> I think one of the things that's very exciting that's, that's happening in the election field is that election officials themselves are starting to say that they need to be more proactive in thinking about what makes a good election and not just sit back and wait for someone to create a pro product and dro drop it in their lap. Dana de Beauvoir in, um, in Texas, the work that has been done in Oregon, the work that's going on in LA, um, I think is really is really promising because it's being done in partnership and collaboration with um, a lot of different kinds of people. Uh, one of the things I think is very hard when you work hard on a research project, you've built a prototype, you have something, and it's sometimes hard to say what's the next step. And until you work with someone who's going to think about either manufacturing or deploying it, it's hard to to know where where this research concept needs to go to make it fit into a real world and be really deployable. And I don't think we do very well at funding that step. Um, we sort of put an idea out there and wait for someone to pick it up. And we don't do very well at saying, OK, it's not going to be entirely yours anymore, but it's not entirely theirs either. You're not going to throw it over the transom, nor are you necessarily going to get to have all the say in it. But there's another round of design concepts where you really think about, what does this project do? What does this project spark? Um, that can, can work. And I'll, I'll do an example for the joystick. Just, I was talking to uh, the folks at VSAP out in LA, and they have just been doing some work with IDEO on some prototype concepts for what the physical uh, ballot booth might look like. And they said, we were really shocked. They have a little pull-out drawer with um, some tactile keypads, uh, tactile keypad on it, and that they were working with people with um, lo with low dexterity and low control over their motion, and that they were just slamming the keypad around because uh, when they hit it, it, they were hitting it quite hard. And I suggested that they look at the joystick, and they said, that's really interesting. Maybe that's the universal divine. Well, there's, there's a gap here that we needs to be filled, and we need to be able to get people like Stephen Blosser and his students and his design team together with the election officials and with the designers who are building the physical enclosure to figure out how to close those gaps and bring it together into a product that can really work. Would anyone else like to add to that? <clears throat> this is a bit of a cop-out, but in many ways for me in my life, Whitney is the missing link. <laughs> and, and so when, you know, <laughs> she, she has a real gift for bringing people together and making connections and making things work. And so part of what um, she's organized is the Center for Civic De Design, which is a nonprofit based here in Maryland. That is um, that does a range of things, but one of the things that that I that it can help do is shepherd ideas across that divide because there is unfortunately you know a, a, a sort of a, a chasm between what we do in the in the university lab and what needs to be done so that it can work in LA, and so to you know having 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 that kind of Having someone with a foot in both worlds is is really invaluable, and there are other Whitneys in the world, and she probably knows them. So, if you if you're interested in that kind of a thing, that's what I that's what I always do is I just go to Whitney and say, who should I be talking to? And she can usually tell me. And I just add, you know, on our um, projects, I think one thing that's really interesting is you know pretty much everything that's been produced has a Creative Commons license or it's in the public domain. Um, and uh, in, in the workshops and in the open IDEO challenge that we had, we had vendors participate in this. Um, so, you, you know, we've worked throughout the project in trying to, um, you know, reduce that burden as much as possible. But it's, it's still very clear that, you know, just because you have a good idea doesn't mean it's actually going to be used in an election. And, and really working on that piece um, is, I think, one of the next big challenges that we have um, because this research is so important, um, but we have to be able to get it to that next step, and we have to figure out the best path forward in that. And, you know, as we've talked about, that includes the certification process. And so I want to talk about the certification a little bit um, because this is obviously a really important issue. Whitney, this is something you've worked on um, for quite a while. 
when we look at the projects that we have here, I mean, if we, if we look at, you know, if we had a, a vendor, I don't know if there's anyone in the room today, um, who said, you know what, I, I love Catherine's Bell, I want that. You know, I, I really like Andrew's case, and I want to use um, the, the joystick uh, from MSU. How does that happen? How, you know, what would it take to actually get that uh, in place? What are the costs? What, are the, what is the process? Because I don't think people realize the challenges involved in this. Well, can, I give a, can I give a shout out to the GTRI team that Andrew Baranek was part of? Because one of the things they did was um, an evaluation of the early concept for LA against the VVSG, but also against universal design principles. So it was um, a very focused look at how this concept would work from a, an accessibility perspective, particularly, and a usability perspective. Um, and they, they identified some gaps. They identified some gaps in the design, which were very informative and helpful, but they also identified places where the current VVSG, because it was written not anticipating mobile ta touch tablets. I mean, we weren't, we weren't dreaming of these things at that point. Well, we were dreaming of them, but we didn't have them. Um, so what happens to that? Does, does that standard still work if we're thinking about touch and we're thinking about how you know, much space you need between touch points? Do, do our standards still work? And what's the process to allow in a flexible, um, responsive way to allow the EAC and the people who work with EAC to say a new technology has come into the world. Does this fit into the current certification process? Do we need to adapt the certification process? Do we need to write new standards for it? And to be able to do that in a much more nimble way than a, than a two to four year process. Sharon? So, so, so often just having a standard does not preclude having a product that has a novel idea that meets the spirit of the standard. So it's not impossible. However, the certification process itself has become, is rather burdensome. I know the EAC, and I'm, I'm not going to speak for them, but I know they are looking in detail at the testing and certification process and trying to speed that up. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Um, um, again, another aspect I think is um, um, involving the manufacturers um, in a more interactive process. And I throw this out to one more thing to pick up what to pick up what Stephen said, which is that um, test when we first launched the VVSG05, the test labs had never tested for usability or accessibility before. Um, if you in fact, I'll add that no one had in a right. test certification right. for usability <laughs> or accessibility. Right. So it wasn't that they didn't understand the words we'd written. It's that they didn't understand the problem they were solving. When they looked at the test, the tests that they did for the electromechanical systems and so on, they understood what they were doing because they had years of experience in it. Um, so there's a need to engage um, people who are experts in the field either because they have learned how the field works or because they are part of the field in whatever way um, to make sure that they understand what, what that test is for. One of the terrible examples we heard was um, one of the con requirements is that there be sufficient contrast so that someone can actually read the text and it not fade into a gray on gray and that you don't use color alone to, dis to, to, to make meaning uh, because not everybody can perceive color. Um, and this was interpreted by one of the, te well, I, I think it was a test lab, and I'm just, which was that you shouldn't use color. But that wasn't the meaning of it. The meaning of it was use color in a, in a good way, use color in a useful way, use color in a way that, that helps everyone and doesn't prevent people from being able to see things. Um, that's just an educational process. So I think we have a lot of ed STEM education to do to make sure that as people come out of our technical schools, they know what this stuff is about, and that, that there's a way to help people who are entering a field and working with a new standard really understand um, what, that, what the impact that standard is meant to have. The other thing that I would say is, I, I'd like to just pick up on what Whitney said earlier about Innovation doesn't necessarily mean we start over from scratch or do things in a completely new way. Perhaps innovation means we start with from where we are and we pick up some of these 50 ideas or we, you know, we we do the the Maryland online ballot system which isn't quite as beautiful as the as the anywhere ballot but was able to it had some technical limitations at the back end that meant we couldn't do everything we learned in the process of the anywhere ballot, but it 
we were able to incorporate a lot of things. It got a lot better over the course of, of three or four months. And so it, and it, it, it as, as Mark said, he said, you know, it's a model. Um, so we can, we can start from where we are and pick up, we can, we can do incremental improvements. Um, and, and there's just a wealth of, of uh, things available that, that any election official or any jurisdiction could start implementing right away that would make a, an appreciable difference on the ground. Yes. Uh, Will, we have a question on the uh, fourth row on the left. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Cole Kleitsch. I'm from New Jersey. Um, the area that I work on in New Jersey is I work with election officials and school officials to bring high school students in as poll workers. Mm -hmm. So basically, I've got a flesh and blood neuron-based technology that is presently the interface for many voters of all kinds. <laughs> um, and they are not the least bit intimidated by the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where I was going to suggest, perhaps, and Ms. Harris made this point, is even within New Jersey with our 567 municipalities, there is a wide variation for the qualitative and, 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 and qualitative and quantitative methods by which election officials teach this. Some mm -hmm. trainings last an hour, some last three. There's mm -hmm. got to be some difference in the outcome in that and the kind of product you're creating. What I would suggest, perhaps, is that 40 states, George is one of them, um, allow students as young as 16 mm -hmm. to be poll workers. Now, some states call them ambassadors, and they don't mm -hmm. quite get the full experience. Mm -hmm. New Jersey does. I mean, when this fall, we're going to be training high school students as young as 16 with veterans together, and then we're going to deploy them as a team of three, uh, one veteran and two students, because if they're 18, they can't last the whole day. It's half and half. Um, but what we found when we tried this literally 10 years ago, it's been that long, but we're doing it again, is that perhaps a 66-year-old or somebody who's been there and who knows the elections process as it's been for decades is an Obi-Wan on George's District 2 when they walk in the door. They know it so well. That young person next to them doesn't know that. But the machine, and New Jersey has 20 count, uh, 19 that use the same machine, if it has a problem, I mean, no disrespect, but the, the digit of choice for that generation is a forefinger. The digits of choice for this next generation are these thumbs. The thumbs will go fix the machine, and they won't have a problem doing that at all. And what I would recommend is, as much as possible, reach out to these places where high school students can do it. They inject a, a level of energy and a social awareness, shall we say, that is a, a above mm -hmm. what we presently have available to us. And we find that it creates other synergies beyond that where it's going to go. So um, again, I would, I, while the technology is being worked on, and you know, right now the only interface is a, is a person mm -hmm. to whatever degree that assists somebody. So again, if you've got a 16-year-old wearing to go, they're open to it. And frankly, they're waiting to be asked. So do. Uh, uh, Fran, you want to comment a little bit on the um, I think you're absolutely right, and I know that there are programs out there that are deliberately or purposefully um, recruiting younger people. Certainly older, retired people make up the bulk of, of poll workers right now. Um, I, it, spe you know, it speaks about this incremental change in the voting process, that it's much more than just the technology, um, that it needs um, uh, um, a much more a research across a greater number of stakeholders, and we need to use that to leverage changing the process. Because technology is part of a process. It's part of a social process. And that needs to be recognized and addressed, not in just in terms of usability um, uh, standards, but also on how people interact with the technologies. And younger folks are going to transform the way we look at and use technologies, especially in the voting process. Um, so I think that we need a little more um, outcomes-oriented you know, research that actually looks at how people use the technologies. Um, that is part of the incremental changes um, that will help change the standards um, that we're trying to establish here and best practices. And can just uh, briefly on that same point, have you encountered it? I, I know you're still in the kind of piloting phase of this uh, poll worker training. But what do, what do you see as the challenges to getting more adoption of that? Um, I think the greatest, uh, the greatest challenge is that um, one of the ways we designed the course was so it could be adapted by states so that they could take what they wanted from it. So if it's part, if it's the only 
um, method that they use to um, educate poll workers about voters with disabilities, okay. But if they already have training uh, programs in place and they want to take a piece of it, that they would be able to use it. Um, I think that is probably the greatest challenge too, is, is getting people I'm getting different states and precincts interested in adapting or being able to see that they can use it as they see fit, basically. For instance, so, something you didn't say about the course that I really admire about it is that it, it's not a lecture, right? It's not screen after screen of rules for people to learn and memorize. It's scenarios that open, that actually suggest discussion so it could be used for scenario-based training. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has a kind of tip sheet of all the different things that they might have discussed, um, including when you need to ask your election officials what the mm -hmm. rules are in your state. And I think that um, the chance of getting 16-year-olds to sit down and memorize a bunch of rules is about zero, uh, maybe negative one. Uh, but the chance of getting them to think through how they could be agents of change mm -hmm. is pretty high. And I, I really admired the way you put that course together. Uh, we have time for uh, one or two more questions, if you uh, have any more. Uh, if not, then uh, we'll just end on, on one final thing, and that's um, just, I'd like to go through the panel. We can start with you, Fran. Um, in terms of, you know, what lessons did you learn that you would like an election official or um, a voting system designer to take from your project or, or the work that you've seen over the past few years? Um, I think having talked to such a, <laughs> One, one of the joys of interviewing um, so many uh, voters with disabilities and talking to them is really is realizing just how um, powerful the individual is um, and um, also talking to a range of stakeholders. Um, I think that different stakeholders need to involve each other in the process so that election officials um, can talk to advocacy groups, can talk to students, can talk to retired people, and find a way to integrate them um, into what is a very powerful, probably the most powerful process of being a citizen in this country. Uh, elaborating a little on, on that, in terms of uh, design of systems and, and thinking about how to test them, the importance of engaging all types of voters, mm -hmm. all types of voters with disabilities to really understand their issues. That's what drives the good design. I, I think the, the main thing that, that, that I keep learning <laughs> and that I keep trying to help my students learn is that um, it's actually fairly easy to be brilliant um, in your design and in your problem solving, and the way to be brilliant is to <laughs> involve your users and do some iteration, have rapid iterative testing and evaluation so that you try it, you fix it, you try it, you fix it, and after a little bit, it starts being brilliant. <laughs> so um, the other thing that, that and I'm surprised at how we're, we're doing some testing for the state of Maryland on a bunch of different voting systems right now, and it's astonishing how much testing they haven't done, mm -hmm. you know. And you see people come in, and, and maybe they're, maybe it's a really smooth interaction for someone who's blind, but they forgot about someone who's blind and has hearing disabilities, or who has mobility and hearing issues, or you know, or perfectly good vision, but um, but and and reasonably good hearing, but. You know, but but and so once you know, it's, it's the different combinations that they haven't really thought through. And so if 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 you do testing with humans, <laughs> um, miracles happen. I want to say yes and yes and yes, and add one more thing that pick up some something that Sharon said, which is that um, we've. We've been focused on how to include people with disabilities and the needs of people with disabilities in the design process, but when we think about how to transform that research into something that's practical, there's a whole another group of people who need the same level of engagement, and that are the pe that's the people who will manufacture and develop these into commercial systems, and the election officials who will have to use and incorporate them and ultimately end up changing their processes because every time you introduce something new, it changes processes, and we need the way 
to take these projects, other projects, and have the same level of engagement to think about what it takes to make them practical in the real world. Great, thank you. And um, again, uh, thanks to our panelists and thanks to all of the participants that we had in our research projects, all of our researchers, and especially the EAC, um, who, uh, you know, without their leadership on this, uh, none of these projects would have been made possible. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And, well, thank you. And so please join me in, in thanking our panel.